As a calculus professor, I see so many students whose mistakes on tests and homeworks have nothing to do with calculus. They're all about algebra. And the, the sort of procedural fluency in algebra is the part that's missing and not actual understanding of calculus concepts. And so in this video, I'm going to share the most common algebra mistakes I see as a math professor so you don't make those same mistakes. Now, the first thing you need to do, the most important thing, is to smash the like button. Because we're mathematicians, we like algorithms, YouTube likes algorithms, you get the idea. And now that you've done that, we can go to the first algebra mistake that people make, which I call cancel palooza. Look, again, some people just like to cancel things, and I do too, but some people just go a little bit too far. They want to cancel everything. So you get an expression like this one, you see the 3x squared on the top, the 3x squared on the bottom, and you know what my students do? They just cancel them. But you can't do that. I mean, you can cancel the one 3x squared, but there's also a 6x cubed in the numerator, and if you have a sum of things in the top, you've got to cancel both terms. So the 3x squared can cancel to 1, but the 6x cubed? That cancels to 2x. Final answer to this one is 1 plus 2x. Or what about this one? I mean, there's a lot of threes around. Three in the bottom, lots of threes on the top. Why don't you just cancel the threes everywhere? Okay, that's no problem. I mean, the six turns into two, the three gets canceled. But hold on, there's a square root there. You can't just take a three inside of a square root and cancel it. That's square root of three, not three, so slow down. That is, just because there's a tendency to cancel everything in sight that looks vaguely related, you've got to pause and think, hold on, is this the exact same thing? It's only then that you're allowed to cancel. Or, for example, take this expression. Well, here, there's also lots of threes, and there's no longer a square root problem, so can I just cancel all the threes? Well, six turns into two, that's no big deal. But here's the problem. This is two different things multiplied, two different expressions and brackets that are multiplied together. You can cancel the three from one of those, but not both. That is, you only got one three on the bottom, and if you're gonna do this, that's like canceling nine from the top. That's not allowed. To help us practice these common algebraic mistakes, we turn to Maple Learn, which is actually the sponsor for this video. I have a document. I've shared the link to this document down in the description, so if you want to play around, you can. And the way Maple Learn works is that if you type in some type of mathematics, for example, here I've typed in some function, this is the one we just saw, then on the right-hand side, it interprets the type of mathematics that you've put in and gives you a range of different options for the types of computations you might want to do. So in this case of a function, I could plot the function, simplify it, differentiate, integrate, treat it as a series centered at zero, a lot of different options. If you put in a different type of mathematics, like, I don't know, a differential equations, for example, you get different contextual options to allow you to solve them. So right here, I want to focus on simplification. So I'm going to click the simplify the expression. And notice what happens right where my function was typed in. It becomes the answer 2x plus 1, which is the simplified version when you correctly cancel of this particular expression. And we've got a nice plot of that linear equation. And we could do it for any of these. Maybe we'll go down to this really complicated one, which is j. I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do. But if I click simplify the expression, then I'm going to get the way that it simplifies. What's really nice, in my opinion, about Maple Learn is that you're not just getting a numerical answer, like the derivative at some point is just some number. You're actually getting the algebraic expression for what is the derivative of any given function, or how do you simplify any given function. The most common issue I see about fractions involves the following issue. Imagine I take, say, 16, and then I divide that by 4, and then I divide that by 2. Okay, so what answer do you get? Well, it depends on your interpretation. As in, is it the case that you imagine that there's brackets around the top? In which case, you would say that this is 16 sort of divided by 4 and then all divided by 2. That's one interpretation. If you did that, you'd get 16 divided by 4 is 4 divided by 2 is just 2. And you'd say that the answer was equal to 2. However, in a different context, you might have had instead the brackets down in the denominator. In which case, you would say that this was going to be the same thing as 16 divided by 4 divided by 2, which is like 16 divided by 2 which is equal to the value of 8. Sometimes we'll use the length of the bar when writing by hand, so like 16 long bar divided by 4 by 2. This one indicates you're supposed to take the 4 divided by 2 and do that one first. 
or it might have been 16 divided by four and then long bar divided by two. And this one indicates that you take the 16 and divide it by the four first. Now, the way I actually prefer to sometimes do this, let me just sort of assert one of them, I'll assert the one on the left, is to replace the 16 with the 16 divided out by one. And after you've done this, then you can go and you can look at the portion which is on the bottom, you can bring it up and flip the fraction, a, a typical trick, 16 divided by one multiplied by two divided by four. And this is a, another way of saying, well, 32 divided by four is eight under this interpretation of which direction we're doing. And the point is, if you always replace this thing that's divided by one and write it out explicitly, this is 16 divided by one, it sometimes then goes and makes your further algebra a little bit less likely to make a mistake. Now, the issue here isn't that one of these interpretations is better than the other. Indeed, you can check out some of my previous videos playing around with order of operations nonsense. Because depending on your context, you might have meant to write one of these or the other. And the real issue is this. If you're sloppy about it, you can write it down thinking you know what it means, thinking you have an interpretation, but then if later you go to compute it out and you use the other interpretation, then you're a little bit screwed. So I always encourage you to be as explicit as possible, perhaps by using brackets or making one of the division symbols just way longer than the other. Either way, you want to make it clear to yourself and to your reader what you're trying to do. Now, I love linear functions like 2x. They have all these nice properties, like if you take, for example, 2 times a plus b, that distributes nicely as 2a times 2b. Linear functions are really cool, but you know what's not cool? When you take a nonlinear function, just pretend that it's a linear function. Like, for example, consider this one, the logarithm of a plus b, that's not equal to the logarithm of a plus b, that's just not a rule. Or the exponential function, e to the a plus b, that's not equal to e to the a plus e to the b, it's not linear. This happens all the time, like a plus b squared. Well, you could expand out this quadratic, you'd get a squared plus b squared plus 2ab, there's extra terms. Or sine is another example, sine of a plus b is not linear, it's not sine of a plus sine of b. Indeed, my, my, maybe my shirt can help you out. This one, that's linear. All those other ones, not linear. You cannot use this property of linearity. And I think it's easy to think that you can because there's lots of rules about logarithm and exponential and trig, but not linear rules. So, so what are the right rules? Like, okay, let's take a look at the logarithm one. Now, there is something that's equal to the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of the b, but it's not logarithm of a plus b. It's logarithm of a times b. That's how the rule works. So this is a nonlinear equation, and, and that's okay as long as you don't treat it as one. And likewise for exponential. So there is an expression for e to the a plus b. Well, it's e to the a times e to the b. Logarithms and exponentials are inverses of each other, so it makes sense that these rules are sort of inverses of each other as well. Okay, and then what about the a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus b squared? That's not true, but it is true here if you put a minus sign on the right-hand side that a plus b times a minus b, this gives the so-called difference of squares, a squared minus b squared. And then finally for sine of a plus b, there's also a formula for dealing with the sine of a plus b. It's a little bit more complicated and looks like this. So yeah, there's a lot of rules out there and it's okay if you don't memorize them all. I just don't want you to make up rules like that a function is linear when it's actually not. Oh, parentheses. It's so easy to make mistakes with parentheses. The type of thing I often see happens, like for example, let me take 3x squared. And then I'm gonna multiply 3x squared by one plus, oh, I don't know, cosine of 2x. And then I'm going to add the value of three to it. So what's the problem with this expression? Well, I have one opening bracket there and a second opening bracket there, but I only have one closing bracket. I need to have a second closing bracket. And so then the question is, which interpretation am I trying to do? Is my closing bracket there or is my closing bracket over there? And you get a very different answer because it changes whether the three is multiplied by that three X squared. The problem isn't that you're a bit sloppy with your parentheses. I don't really care about that. The problem is that when you write it down, you may have been interpreting it one way, 
But a little bit later, if you've been sloppy with your brackets and you don't know which you're trying to write it down, you may interpret it the other way. So it's okay not to have perfect notation, but sometimes not having perfect notation results in mistakes. If you don't put any brackets down, then you've got like a 50% chance of screwing it up and interpreting it the other way from when you wrote it down. The next trick is all about exponents. And I think just people find exponents tricky because there's lots of fractions and negative signs and exactly how you deal with them can be a little bit complicated. The first thing I look at is that negative sign. And what a negative does is it alternates whether something's on the top or whether it's on the bottom. So if you've got it on the top with a negative sign, just put it down on the bottom with a positive. If in this case, it's a negative on the bottom, this is just the same thing as x to the 3 halves up on the top. The negative sign just changes whether it's on the top or the bottom. And the next thing I look at is the divided by 2, because I can really think of 3 divided by 2 as 3 multiplied by 1 half. This is helpful because we have a rule for when you take a product in an exponent. This is just like doing the first of them, x cubed, and then raising all of that to the power of 1 half. And then finally, raising something to the power of 1 half, you might recognize that's just going to be the same thing as taking the square root of whatever it is. In this case, the square root of x cubed. All right, so if you have your own common algebra mistakes that you make or any other algebra tricks, leave them down in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a like for that YouTube algorithm and we'll do some more math in the next video.